Okay, guys. Uh, so today, what we're going to go through is uh, ethics in psychology. So now we're doing the research methods uh, module. So uh, for last week, I posted a few things for you. Uh, you know what I wanted you to go through. So you have ethical guidelines that we'll talk about, and then there's a specific case, like an example case study. Um, that you can talk about and a specific question about Rosemary Kennedy that I wanted you to answer as well. Um, so what we mean by uh, ethics in psychology, you've probably heard this word before, like to you, what does ethics mean if someone is acting in an ethical way? Um, you know, if someone is unethical, what kind of things would they be doing if they were unethical? So in terms of psychology, and in terms of for your GCSE, um, there are some key words you need to know when we're talking about ethics. For example, uh, deception, informed consent, uh, the right to withdraw, confidentiality, uh, protection of participants. These are kind of key uh, words that you need to know in regards to ethics um, in, in psychology. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to name some ethical guidelines in research. So what kind of things that researchers should be doing to make sure their research is ethical. Um, and again, weigh up costs and benefits of these ethical guidelines. Now, of course, keeping studies ethical is the ideal situation, but it's not always practically possible or it's very difficult to practically do this in some uh, psychology experiments. And... Uh, in many experiments, as I'll explain to you later, um, for example, one of the things is deception. So deception sometimes is actually necessary for um, the, the study to actually make sense and be valid. So it's not always a case that all of these are necessarily um, followed. Deception maybe is one of them that usually um, you may see breached, depending on the study. So in the UK, you have some uh, an organization called the BPS, the British Psychological Society. So they represent psychology, they represent psychologists in the UK. Uh, for example, when I did my uh, psychology degree, um, you know, graduate psychologists, you know, will get a membership to the BPS. Anyone who's a practicing psychologist or a therapist, um, they, you know, are generally a member of this society in the UK. Um, but they do lots of work around ethical guidelines. So even psychologists who are working for universities and they're doing research, they, they need to follow the guidelines of the BPS, of the British Psychological Society. Um, now, there are many reasons for this. And it's not just in the UK. Uh, for example, in America, they have, again, the APA, the, the American Psychology Association. Uh, and in other countries, they have similar boards which do a similar kind of function. Um, so these BPS ethical guidelines, um, these relate to practical work. So if you're carrying out experiments, you should follow these kind of steps and this code of conduct for it to be um, taken as serious research. And, you know, again, on a legal basis so that you don't get into trouble by breaking the law. So uh, one example uh, of research that used to be done, lobotomies. So a lobotomy is a surgical operation. Basically, it, it kind of removes a chunk of the brain. And by doing that, these connections to the prefrontal cortex, this area at the front of your brain, um, you know, is, is severed. Now, it used to be a treatment to, to cure mental illness. So what happened was people used to get lobotomies or electric shock treatment um, because people believed that this was the best way to cure mental illness, maybe schizophrenia or depression or severe anxiety or someone was um, hallucinating, for example, you know, this was seen as a cure. Although now it's um, extremely rare if, you know, if done at all, because there are other non-invasive methods to treat patients um, and the ethics of doing something like this, you know, are called into question. There are many countless examples of unethical studies in psychology uh, studies that were done a long time ago before these kind of guidelines took place. Um, so, you know, you can do a little bit of web research and find out all kinds of bizarre experiments um, and some really tragic experiments that doctors have done or, for example, the military have, have done on prisoners, which wouldn't 
follow any ethical guidelines today. So this is why it's important. These are why these guidelines are here to protect uh, participants, to protect people from harm. Um, so in regards to the, the ethical guidelines, I will just show you briefly um, you know, what some of these ethical guidelines are. So for example, the first one uh, I will go through here is informed consent. So basically, this means potential participants need to know exactly what's going to happen to them in the research. So they need to give their consent. They need to give their permission to the researchers to say, yeah, that's fine. I'll take part in this research. Now, the problem with this, it doesn't always happen because some experiments, if you were to tell the participants the actual reason for your test or your experiment, they will show something called demand characteristics, which means that they will figure out what you're trying to do. And if they figure that out, then they might behave differently. Because what you're trying to do as a psychologist, you're trying to see how people would behave in the real world, how people would behave normally. But if you're putting someone in a laboratory or in an unfamiliar setting and they figure out what you're trying to do, they're not going to behave like they would in real life. So that causes a problem for your results because how much can you trust your results if that is um, you know, the example? So think back to the experiments we've looked at in other units, and uh, especially for example, in social psychology. Now remember we talked about the ASH study on conformity or the Milgram study. Now if people knew what the experimenter was trying to do, I don't think they would have pushed the voltage all the way up in the Milgram study. And in the ASH study, they probably wouldn't have um, conformed to other people and said that the lines were the same length. Because if they, if they were to do that, if they, if they knew what the intention of the study was, um, they probably wouldn't have done that. Yeah? So that's why it's important. Sometimes um, what a researcher might do is tell a participant look, this study is on something else. So they'll tell them it's a psychology study. They'll come up with a believable lie, but they won't tell them the real reason until after the experiment. So after the experiment, generally they will tell them what it's about. Yeah, um, so again, this comes under, let's say, deception. So lying to people or misleading them about something to do with the study. As long as it doesn't harm the participants, and the study is actually useful to our understanding. So it's got to be, there's got to be a good reason why you might lie to the participant. Um, and if you can make the case, like I've mentioned, if you don't lie to the participants, it might make your research invalid. Then generally you will get approval for that. Um, so as long as they're protected and as long as it's explained after the study why you lied to the participant at the time. The other important thing you need to know is about the right to withdraw. So giving people the opportunity to leave the study at any time and remove their results if they no longer want to take part. So this is important. So people don't feel forced to do the study if they feel uncomfortable with uh, for whatever reason, they have the right to actually leave the study. Um, so, so that's an important uh, aspect as well. And and. You want to protect your participants. Now, this is a wider kind of area as well. So participants shouldn't be harmed physically or psychologically. Now, the issue here is psychological harm is something difficult to define. So how much do we know how, how someone might react to a study? Um, if it's something that's particular to them, they might feel quite anxious about. We may not have known this before. Some studies, they screen participants. They check if there's um, participants who might be more prone to being harmed by this research, research, then they will avoid having them on the study. So they will look at minimizing risks. If the harm is short-term and relatively minor, maybe someone is slightly shocked um, at the time, but if they were debriefed quickly enough, um, then you could argue they, the, the harm to them is quite minor. Maybe it's embarrassment, slight embarrassment at the time or slight shock, but they can recover from it, then that's fine. And 
you want to make sure the participants do not leave the study with any long-term harm or distress. This is why the next point here, debriefings are so important. If you have a debriefing, it means telling participants what the study was about before they leave. Um, if any of you guys remember when my A-level students were doing their studies, if you did a test with one of the A-level students, uh, students, they should have done a debrief with you. Tell me if they did it, because they should have done this. But they should have explained to you what the study was about, given you an opportunity to ask any questions. And if there was any distress involved in the experiment, again, this would be a chance for the researcher to reassure the participant and just make sure that they were OK uh, and they wouldn't leave the the, uh, the test scenario, you know, still feeling anxious or worried. It's very important as a researcher that you do that. Um, the last thing is confidentiality. So if you do a study, you want to keep this information confidential. Don't share this information without the participant giving permission for this. Um, when you see a psychology study published, generally, unless it's a specific case study, like do you remember the case study of um, Phineas Gage, for example, um, but that's a very unusual case. But most studies, they won't focus on individual people or individual names. You will have a list of people who did the experiment. And everyone is basically given a number or some kind of code. Or the results are just published for 20 people, 50 people, 100 people. Um, so in that way, their results are confidential. Only the researcher has access to the the participant information so the researcher can get in contact with the participants after the study but no one else can take this information unless the participant has given permission for this um again researchers can get into a lot of trouble if they don't follow those guidelines okay so in a nutshell these are the key ethical issues that you need to consider now there is a case study that i'm going to read to you uh, and so for this week's assignment, I want you to read through the notes, but also apply this. Apply this to the case study of Rosemary Kennedy, for example. OK, um, so I will just bring up the notes for Rosemary Kennedy. Now, Rosemary Kennedy, at the age of 23, Rosemary Kennedy was given a lobotomy to control her moodiness. Rosemary had been known to have a violent behavioral pattern. So her doctor, Dr. Walter Freeman, the leading doctor to perform this procedure recommended um, that she undergo the procedure. Now, she, the doctor had suggested this to Rosemary's father. So in 1941, when only 65 lobotomies had been performed, so only 65 lobotomies had ever been done um, in, in the US, I believe. So Mr. Kennedy gave permission. This is important here. Mr. Kennedy gave his permission. The permission was not necessarily given by Rosemary. The surgery left her incontinent. Uh, incontinence basically means that you um, you don't have control of your bowel movements. You're basically how you poop. Uh, and her brain was reduced to the mentality of a young child. So during the day, she would stare at walls for hours. Uh, her verbal skills, her language was unintelligent babble. So basically, she wasn't able to talk or have conversations with anyone anymore. Eight years after her lobotomy, she was moved to a home for disabled people. Um, she became detached from the family because of her mental capacity, but received regular visits from her sister Eunice. There were occasions when she would uh, visit her family and her childhood home, and she passed away at the age of 86 of natural causes. Now, let's work it out here. So from the age of 23, she was given this lobotomy. So she lived more than 50 years with this, as I mentioned here already, yeah? Incontinence, with her, you would say her verbal skills were lowered. Um, her general brain function was extremely limited. So now hopefully you can see from this case what potential ethical issues there are. Let's go back to the ethical issues here. So you have to consider here, was there informed consent? Was this explained to Rosemary? 
Did she give her own consent for this? Who gave the consent for her? Do you think that's a problem? Do you think that's an issue? Um, deception. Did the doctor lie to her or to her father about the risks of the procedure? Um, was there a right to withdraw? Could Rosemary say no to this procedure? Do you think she may have felt pressured to go through with this procedure? After the procedure was done, was there any way to turn back time? And was she protected? Now remember, protection on participants. Was there any harm identified? Was it unavoidable? Now today, do you think Rosemary would have been offered this treatment do you think the harm was short-term and minor, or do you think it was more long-term and damaging? And again, was this kept confidential, or was there a debriefing? Uh, these are, you know, in this context, maybe not the most important ones to focus on, but again, have a think about the rest of these questions. So as you're writing the question, challenge question for you, how was her case unethical, okay? Giving you a big clue here, it wasn't ethical, so you need to explain why it was unethical and how the study should have been done instead. How do you think the doctor should have approached this instead? Okay, so going through your notes, I want you to look at this um, and then I want you to write a response to this challenge question. Try and give some more details. If you want, uh, you know, have a look online, see if there are any other resources that can help you with this as well. Okay, so. Uh, just make sure you have finished this before next week's lesson. Okay, thank you guys.